Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. My name's Mark an alcoholic. And uh, I was separated from uh, alcohol and cocaine the morning of October 19th of 1982 in Denver, Colorado. And uh, I'm grateful for that, and the world's a better place because of it. Uh, It was a tornado roaring through the lives of other people, and uh, I don't ever want to forget that. Uh, uh, My home group is the Carry This Message group in Austin, Texas. We're a fundamental AA group. Open in three minutes of meditation, and we have a chairperson, and uh, you can only bring up a topic out of the recovery portion of the big book. That's the doc's opinion through the first 164. And uh, you can't talk for more than five minutes. We have a timer. If it goes off, we ask that you stop in mid sentence. <laughs> Part of what we're about is are you awake? Wake up. Get free of this idea because your eyes are open, you're awake. See, that almost killed me. But uh, small little group, I don't like big groups. I got, I sobered up in Denver in small groups. I still like them today. And uh, we uh, we laughed the other day. We did a group conscious two months ago, and we we, most of the time we'd have between eight to ten people there, and someone said, "Well, the group's not going." We realized it's because we weren't telling anybody about it. (laughs) So. We had a huge turnout last month. We had 15 there. So we, but you know how we get. We're selfish people, right? So if you got something good, you, you want to keep it to yourself for a while. Uh, what an experience being down here. What a wonderful thing. I, I, I love Brad's story. See, that's how it is. That's how my life is. Uh, when I came into the rooms at Alcoholics Anonymous, little coincidences here and there that begin to manifest. And uh, here's the other part in the equation. Some of you think you probably chose to be here. None of us chose to be here. We all made a decision in a third step. We offered ourselves to God to do with us as he willed, and he's got us here together, including me. And just to set the record straight versus this $2,000 that uh, Brad talked about, uh, (laughs) when he he was asking about coming down, he said, well, by the way, there's a few other things. uh, You're going to have to pay your own way. Of course, I didn't know at that time. as about a $500 round-trip ticket, but he said, I'll do my best to find a place for you to stay. You're going to have to buy all your food and all the rest, you know, but, and I said, uh, okay, all right, let's do it. Let's come on down and have some, uh, have some fun, you know, uh, what, a, what a great deal. Uh, one of the things I, I would like to do is to take a minute and... Um, I want to say a prayer for us, and I'll tell you why. Whether you're brand new or whether you've been sober a long time, the biggest noose around your neck is the same one that's around mine, and that's what you think you know about what's going to happen here. And you bring it in your current belief systems and your dogma and your attachment to what you think you know. See, the truth is none of us have ever been together in this moment, in this time, so nobody here has a clue about what's going to happen. If I lose sight of that, what I take into all the meetings and when I'm working with somebody is my preconceived ideas about what's going to happen. What I've learned over time through the disciplines of steps 10, 11, and 12 is to take a beginner's mind to everything. To everything. How do you walk back into your home group day after day, week after week, month after month, and stay plugged into that, stay open, unless you have a beginner's mind and understand that, for example, all of you that belong to that home group when you were in there this evening, you've never been together this evening in that group. Therefore, you've never had that experience, right? Wake up, wake up to that, see? Never been in this moment before. See, I get a little slow in the uptake. Uh, Some of you probably have read the book, Chuck Chamberlain, New Pair of Glasses. So I'm reading that book, and he's married to the same woman forever. And I don't know if there's any such thing as enlightened people in the rooms of AA. I find that a little hard to believe. But if there was, he's as close as there is. 
If you ever listen to his tapes and you read and you know anyone that knows him, that guy was devoid of self as far as I could tell. But I'm sitting here and I'm reading one day and he's talking about every morning he gets up and he's got a new woman sitting across from him. Now, I know he wasn't cheating on his wife. I knew he was talking about his wife. And I'm thinking, what does he mean by that? How can he be married to the same woman like it was 30, 40 years or something like that? But he wakes up every morning and there's a new woman there. What does he mean by that? About five years later, I finally got it. See, he was awake. And he realized that every morning when he woke up and he sat across from that woman, he had never been in that moment with that woman before. And I'll bet you that guy's life was juicy, baby. <laughs> See? See, you, you get present, steps 10 to 11, this other work. If it swoops you into the present like it does me, I mean, I, Craig, here's the difference if you're sober for a while and you really work with the disciplines. He and I first get here on, on Thursday and, and we're going for a walk. And he's got his head down just going like a chihuahua, baby. He's moving. Now, I'm a lot more awake, and I've never been here before, and I'm going in slow motion, and Cabo is swooping in. I mean, I can't even begin to handle it. He's turning around. What are you doing? Hurry up. And I go, whoa, man. <laughs> you know, it's right out of a Cheech and Chong movie, you know. It's just, wow, did you see that? You know, and the colors, and you, whoa. The ocean away, whoa. You know, it's, it's bartender, I know he thinks I'm smoking reefer, you know. I just... Just sit there, just looking, you know, and the people and the colors and just swoops in on you, you know. And every day it's like that. See, what an incredible, what a incredible experience that is. Found my tribe. I was sent to you all. I call, I call the rooms of AA my tribe. I've been looking for a tribe, <laughs> and uh, I found one. And everywhere I go, you know, there, there we are. So let's take a minute, and if you'll uh, join me in a prayer. Uh, this prayer for me came out of We Agnostics. If you've done much work with that chapter, you might have an awareness that the word prejudice is used in there a lot, six, seven, eight, nine times, and they finally beg us to lay aside our prejudice. And if you look up the word prejudice, it means preconceived thought or opinion. So out of that is I begin to work with a prayer that I use whenever I go to meetings, where I'm sitting down to work with someone, whatever, I'm going to go back through the steps again. And it goes something like this. Our Creator, we thank you for bringing us together in fellowship and love. We understand that we're joined together as a spiritual body, and there's so much more going on here than we realize. Help us to set aside everything we think we know about the big book, the 12 steps, the program, the fellowship, in all spiritual things, especially you, God, so I may have an open mind in a new experience with all these things. Please help us see some new truth. Amen. Mm. I want to read something from uh, one of the books I'm currently working with. For you big book thumpers who think I'm doing something sacrilegious. The 11 step says, be quick to see where religious people are right. Make use of what they offer. And I do. Tenth and eleventh step gave me freedom to go out in the world and, and, and spend some time exploring all this incredible stuff out there. These books and Buddhism and monasteries and Christian mystics and all this neat, neat stuff. See, I do a lot of stuff in the eleventh step along with, but never instead of. Some of you may know people like I. I've known people who like to do religious stuff instead of the rooms, and most of them, based on my experience, get drunk. So some of my teachers got real clear with me. You do this stuff along with, not instead of. So I do. This is one of my teachers, a man named Anthony DeMell. It's called Awareness. It says on waking up. Spirituality means waking up. Most people, even though they don't know it, they are asleep. They're born asleep. They live asleep. They marry in their sleep. They breed children in their sleep. They die in their sleep without ever waking up. They never understand the loveliness and the beauty of this thing that we call human existence. All mystics, Catholic, Christian, non-Christian, no matter what their theology and no matter what their religion, are unanimous on one thing, that all is well. All is well. Though everything is a mess, all is well. 
Strange paradox, to be sure. But tragically, most people never get to see that all is well because they're asleep. They're having a nightmare. Waking up is unpleasant, you know. You're nice and comfortable in bed. It's irritating to be woken up. That's the reason the wise guru will not attempt to wake people up. I hope I'm going to be wise here and make no attempt whatsoever to wake you up if you're asleep. It's really none of my business, even though I say to you at times, wake up. My business is to do my thing to dance my dance. If you profit from it, fine. If you don't, too bad. As the Arabs say, the nature rain is the same, but it makes thorns grow in the marsh and flowers in the garden. When I was brought into the, into the rooms in 1982, I had brain damage, kidney damage, and liver damage, and everything I owned fit in a duffel bag. And that's how I came to you. I ran it as long and as hard as I could. And alcohol was my master. I joke with uh, people I work with about if you don't want to do this, and I, I want to get clear with you all based on my experience what this is, and it's about a hell of a lot more than going to meetings, by the way. I tell them that, you know, why don't you just go ahead and build an altar to your drug of no choice. <laughs> Little play on words. I, I sit in meetings of AA and hear somebody say my drug of choice is alcohol, and I think to myself, well, then what are you doing in the rooms of AA? If your drug of choice is alcohol, choose not to drink it. If you're sitting in this room and you're an alcohol, your drug of no choice is alcohol. That's why you're in the rooms. My drug of choice is Excedrin. I buy it. I only take two. It sits in the cabinet for six to nine months. I don't mortgage the house and lose a relationship because of Excedrin. That's a drug of choice. Alcohol is my drug of no choice, which is why a lot of these slogans that you hear, which, by the way, are not in the book, things like, just don't drink, no matter what. Well, no matter what I drink. Just don't drink, even if your ass falls off. My ass even hits have fallen off, I used to drink. But uh, later I found out none of that's in my book. That Those terms refer to expressions of people who are not like me. Because I'm a real alcoholic. You know, earlier uh, this evening, there was a lady that was talking about she was hoping she could remember the shame and remorse behind her drinking to keep her sober. And I don't know about you, but I can't. Book's very clear, I can't. Consequences have never kept me, never kept me from drinking. Ever. That's what it means to be a real alcoholic, where you've lost the power of choice. And I was separated from alcohol, and, and my story is not one of coming in and out of the rooms, by the way. Uh, I was that tornado. Uh, I roared through relationships, been married and divorced four times, engaged six times. <laughs> well, toward the end, see, I couldn't do very well at supporting myself. Somebody had to. So, see, nice alcoholics scare me. See, it's inconsistent with the big book, right? It says the root of my problem is I'm selfish and self-centered. I'm like a tornado roaring through the lives of others. They don't want to come in the room and pretend I'm nice. It's not a room full of nice people when we get here. Do we get change and transforms? Absolutely. What's the promise? I have a psychic change. I have a revolutionary spiritual experience. Then as far as I can tell, I get to improve and grow using the spiritual disciplines of the 10th and 11th step. Strict spiritual discipline, by the way. Strict spiritual disciplines. I want to take a moment and tell you my current experience. Some of you have been sober for a while. By the way, I, one of the things that I hope I get to do this evening and in the next two evenings is to disturb some of you about the question of alcoholism, which in the chapter working with others says it's a good thing if I do that. Because maybe if you'll get disturbed, you may or may not change your course of action. But particularly, this is for people who've been sober for a while. You find yourself saying this very often, you're probably headed for trouble. Well, when I came in, 
and when I came in, and when I came in, just like my body can't live off the food I ate two weeks ago, you can't live off that experience. It's deadly. I got a guy at my rehab right now that had 23 years. When I came in, when I, and I started asking him. So he picked up a drink. He drank for two years straight. He spent almost two months in a VA hospital because he had drank himself almost into a wet brain. So now his head's clearing, and I get to talking to him. He hadn't done anything with the steps in years, hadn't touched inventory, wasn't doing anything with the disciplines of 10, 11, living off an old experience. And he picked up a drink. I don't know if he'll ever come back. So what's my current experience? Every morning that I have been down here, I get up, and after a little coffee, I open my big book to Upon Awakening. And I read and I say all of those prayers out of my big book. And then I have a timer, and I'm doing a 10-minute meditation, and I do that meditation. Then all through the day, I work with the 10-step tools. What do I mean by 10-step tools? There's all kinds of them. Ask, turn, cease, sixth sense, how can I best serve thee? Thy will not mine be done. Eleven step tool, pause when agitated or doubtful. Many times throughout the day, thy will be done. And then when Craig and I go back and we're sitting in our room tonight, we're going to go to the big book and we're going to do our evening review and we're going to answer all those questions about our day. And I do all this, ladies and gentlemen, for one reason. The only reason I'm standing here up here sober, if you believe the book, and I do, is because I'm in fit spiritual condition, and those are the things that keep Mark Houston in fit spiritual condition. Not God. Is God a part of all that? Yes. If staying sober was about God, this book would be one page. It'd say, God keeps you sober. Have a great day. <laughs> but I find this book to be full of action, which I have to take. See, an easier, softer way would be God keeps us sober, wouldn't it? No work associated with that. See? So, I'll, I'll just throw this out, a little something for you all to chew on. Um, if you want to know what you believe in, look at your actions. So, I just described what the big book is very, very clear on how Mark stays in fit spiritual condition. So all of you take some time and just sit and look and just take the last seven days and ask yourself, did you do what this book says to do in steps 10 and 11? And if the answer is no, then I think you need to sit with a question. And here's the question. Are you assuming you're in fit spiritual condition because you've been sober for a while? Right? Are you assuming that? Are you living off an old experience? Does just going to a meeting keep you in fit spiritual condition? See? Whenever I write inventory, I want to know what I'm up against. I always look at my actions, what the things I'm doing or not doing, and then I look at the subsequent belief system. So, for example, if you're not doing evening review, what do you think the belief system is? Anybody. Yeah, you don't need it. I'm okay. I don't need to do evening review for fit spiritual condition, but this book's real clear on that. Is it not? Right? If you're not doing upon awakening and doing saying those prayers and doing some meditation, what's the belief system? It says upon, it says upon awakening. We consider our plans for the day. It goes through all kinds of prayers, right? So what do you think the belief system is? I don't have to do it, and I'm okay. Right? As far as I can tell, my book says I'm giving a data reprieve contingent on one thing and one thing only, my fit spiritual condition. Now, let me tell you some reasons why I'm so adamant about this. I've worked in the field of chemical dependency now for 18 years, and I've buried a lot of people. And they used to die in their rooms, and they're still dying, but they ain't dying in the rooms no more. They're going to these hospitals and rehabs. Then they're dying. They used to die in the rooms. I sobered up in Denver, Colorado my third year. I remember... 90 days, 14 people drank themselves to death. That used to happen in our rooms. Now that doesn't happen in our rooms, and there's a real subtle thing going on. You know what it is? If I relapse, I'll make it back. That is not my experience. Between my ninth and 10th year, because I wasn't doing the things that I'm sharing with you that I now do, I wound up in an insane asylum in Houston, Texas. Spent 45 days there, almost committed suicide. 
My mind sober drive mo drove me wacko. <laughs> Some of you can relate to that. They wanted to assign all kinds of other labels to why I was in that place. But I know why I was in that place. I was dying of untreated alcoholism. Period. Stone cold say so we're going to a lot of meetings, living off an old experience. Dying inside from the disease of untreated alcoholism. You know, as far as I can tell, I'm either growing or I'm going. And there is nothing in between for a guy like me. I got to come at my spiritual life the same way I came at vodka. And I was a mad dog. I didn't care about anybody or anything. And I did worship vodka. And I mean that. And if you're sitting here, the same is probably true for you. Do we sit and say, oh, I love my children? Really? Did they go to rehab with you? No, you didn't. See, I, you, all you got to do, look at your actions as to what you love. As far as I can tell, there's three things I have deeply loved in my life. Myself, vodka, and God. And everything else just fit somewhere in there. <laughs> 20 years, booze. Booze, altar, worship at the altar of booze. You know why I know that? I broke the hearts of every human being who ever cared about me because I... Because I went where booze told me to go. I may as well got up every morning and said, oh, King Alcohol. <laughs> Name of the, right? Do with me as you wish. Because it did. Right? Alcohol didn't care about those wives I had who I loved. I'm not a bad man. I was born and raised in, in Iowa. I was raised with good values, Norwegian people. I know the difference between right and wrong. I know what it's like to honor a relationship. And I took a drink of booze. You think booze cares about that? Not hardly. She looks good. <laughs> See? You think booze cares about career? I don't think so. They won't find out. <laughs> right? Rapacious creditor was the term. But I really realized one time in reading the big book that alcohol was my master, and I got that. I got what I worshipped at the throne at. And then I had those first nine, nine and a half years. And don't get me wrong, I had some good years in there. But I rested my laurels, and I lived off an old experience. And if I could save anybody in this room that experience, I'll do it. So I'm tired of burying alkies, particularly alkies who get some time and pick up a drink. Because what you're up against is the progressive nature of alcoholism. And if you think you're sitting in this room and you get 10 years and pick up a drink, it's like before then, you are wrong. You're up against yourself. Big time. Drank for 20 years. Got separated from alcohol by this power, this God. Along the way, I got drafted. I spent 13 and a half months in Vietnam. A period of years, went in the corporate world. I drank all that up. Had a couple of brothers back in Colorado. They were entrepreneurs in the drug dealing business. Since my resume no longer fit other places, I decided to join forces with them, so I did that for a couple of years. That's not what I went to college to learn, by the way, but uh, alcoholism turned me into something I'm not. But it became a normal way of life. I can't separate the true from the false. I think it's normal to carry a gun in the boot and drink and fight and chase women, and act almost sociopathic. Matter of fact, when I, when I had my first real first step experience, I got excited to finally found out what was wrong with me, which was I was an alcoholic with a craving of the body and obsession of the mind. The reason I was excited, it finally gave me an answer to behavior that looked very sociopathic, psychopathic. <laughs> and I don't know if you know, but you can't treat the, either one of those conditions. So when I found out, and I can give you a lot of examples. I'm living with a gal in Denver, Colorado. She has a young child. I go to the store to get milk. I go to Bennigan's. I take a drink. Seven days later, I wake up in a mobile home in Jackson Hole, Wyoming, which is 800 miles away. That was not where I planned on going when I left Aurora, Colorado. And then it's weird because I didn't have a clue where I was. 
and I'm looking out this window, and there's this woman. I've never seen her before. None of this landscape looks familiar, and I, she has mail there, and I see I'm in Jackson Hole, Wyoming. No recall of how I got here. And I had stuff like that happen hundreds of times. I'm up in Alaska. My grandmother dies. I want to go to a funeral, and I get on the plane. Six days later, I wake up in a hotel in St. Louis, missed the funeral. Didn't want to miss the funeral. I wanted to be there. I love that woman, and I didn't know why. And you have that stuff happen enough at some point in time, you really start asking yourself some questions about what is wrong with me. And that big book said, I'll tell you what's wrong with you, Mark. When you take a drink, it takes you. Wow. That's right. That line in there, it explains many things for which Mark could not otherwise account. Wow. What a great thing. Now I know why I did that. That didn't make me any feel better about it, but at least I had an explanation, right? See, that incredible first step experience. First 33 pages of the big book are divided to asking one question. When I take a drink, do I lose power, choice, and control over how much? Period. Every year, I rework the first nine steps. I'll tell you why. Because I fall asleep sometimes. I'll do my evening review. Craig and I did it last night. Were you resentful? Yes. Now, here's what I haven't done. I did have a resentment last night. I haven't written a four-column inventory on it yet, though, and I haven't done a fifth step, and I haven't done six and seven and eight. And what will happen in the course of a year's time is I have this stage character I call the spiritual man that likes to think he's so evolved he hardly ever gets resentful. He's such a good member of AA. And uh, he shows up sometimes and, you know, oh, you don't, you, you don't resent him, Mark. Oh, yeah, I do. Yeah. <laughs> so once a year, I always find a... a, a a bunch of resentments I need to write on. So January of every year, I take a look at, uh, you know, some of you may even want to consider doing this. I take a look at what I call my current unmanageability. Here's what I mean by that. Remember, I told you, I'm not interested in when I came in. I'm not interested in last year. Everyone in this room, you have some current, uh, current unmanageability. You have some current spiritual malady stuff. It might be your health. It might be finances. It might be relationships. It might be illness. It could be a host of things. It might be grief. It might be sadness. But you, everyone in this room, you've got some current unmanageability, I assure you. That's the stuff we're going to get drunk over, ladies and gentlemen. It's not the stuff from back here, back when. And unless some of you become enlightened between now and then, it bothers you. Every one of you in the past week have had the same fears cycling through your mind, that interior dialogue. So I make a list of my current unmanageability. I'll give you an example of some of mine. One of them is my physical body. Currently not smoking, thank God. <laughs> it's been a, been a tough one. Serious addiction to nicotine. I, I want to develop a lifestyle for the next 30 years of my life and smoking two packs of Marlboro Reds a day doesn't fit that, if you know what I mean. Is that something I can drink over? Yeah, I got a guy, a pal of mine I've known for 10 years. One time he wanted to be a monk. Got throat cancer. Seven years sobriety, went on a rip-roaring drunk. Drank for two months. Just got through doing chemo, two months of chemo. Had to bring him down into my rehab. Can you drink behind the illness? You bet you can. Current unmanageability. Here's another area, current unmanageability. I call it time slash people balance. Started a new business 19 months ago. Got 27 employees already. They need my time. They're like little piranhas. <laughs> then I got sponsees like Craig. 
See, he, I, I appreciate his honesty. He told you, he, he, nine years sober. I'm on a trip, not even high. How was it? Be able to do it about me, about me, about me, about me, about me, me, right? And I got five, just like him. <laughs> Get them together, it sounds like a convention of old women. <laughs> Noise level off the charts, right? See? So in addition to all these employees, I got five protégés like that. See? And I get asked to go around and do stuff like that. I only do six of these things a year. Uh, I had to laugh when I, I don't know what a circuit speaker is. I always think of some guy riding a jackass somewhere when I hear that. But, you know, <laughs> the, the, the most I can do with you is share my experience and, and, and share with you some things that I do. And out of that, if you find some stuff you can do and have your experience, there was time well spent. That's all. Um, if you ever listen to my stuff, trust me, it changes all the time. And the reason it changes, I'm always doing my work. My work. That experience in the nut house caught my attention. You know the one that I was resting on my laurels? <laughs> I don't care to go there again. I had great insurance and they had a key. I pulled a jack, one flew over the cuckoo nest. It was yes, sir, yes, ma'am, anything to get out of there. Boy, I had to fake wellness. <laughs> See, we're not well. You know, the tribe I belong to, we're not well. We'll always be on the fringes. Our heads do not look at things right. One of the reasons I, I love Anthony DeMello, I'm reading his book, and he says in there, I want to write a book. And the title of the book is, I'm an ass, you're an ass, and it's okay that we're both asses. <laughs> and I thought, that describes the rooms of AA. See, it's just, here, by the way, if, if you're new, I want to help you with something. You're never going to get well. Now, you'll stay sober and have a lot of fun, but you will not get well. I'll sit at home, do my morning disciplines, do my prayer, my meditation, got my cat hobo there just chilling out. Man, I'm all hooked up. I'm a little sunbeam for God. <laughs> then I put my hand on the door, and it's on. <laughs> Go out and get my GMC Yukon, and my head's already, who's going to get in front of me now? <laughs> Six o'clock, and I want to go through Starbucks, and I got a little old blue-haired lady in front of me. <laughs> just had this great love of God in my heart. This voice says, if she don't speed up, I'm going to ram her. <laughs> See, that's not right. <laughs> but that's me. That's your speaker. The difference between me and a lot of folks, I don't pretend I'm well. <laughs> See? We I tell all the guys I work with, you know, don't be laying that well stuff out on me, right? See? But you have a lot of fun with it. Have a lot of fun with it. God, I don't know what I'd do without this program. I remember 15 years sober one time going to a grocery store. I'm sitting up, getting ready to go inside, and this fear, this overwhelming fear begins to crowd through my body. It's like, okay, what's going on here? I'm afraid to go in the grocery store. So I had the voice. I had the dialogue. You know the dialogue we have with ourselves all day long, the voices, right? What are you afraid of? Well, somebody might say hi and look you in the eye. Well, that ain't that big a deal. Yeah, it is. Right? And the voice is going. Fifteen years sober. I don't know how old I was then. but And I, I'm afraid to go into a grocery store, for God's sakes, to buy groceries. So I say a prayer, and then I feel okay, and then I go in. Realizing. I, I have my own opinion about this. I... I have a feeling that I don't know if there's such a thing in reincarnation or how it is all this stuff happens, but I, I like to work with visuals, and I sometimes think that God and St. Peter, when we came down the pike, were playing poker. And they just like, and there's certain things we were supposed to come down here with. And because they were playing poker and not paying attention, we got past them without it. God says, oh, God, we missed a few. They'll become Alkies. See, because I was never comfortable till I had that drink. Then I was okay. 
See, it's felt like, it always has felt like I straddled the world, straddled both sides. And what I finally came to realize, I, when the book says no middle-of-the-road solution, I either need a lot of whiskey or I need a lot of God, period. I can't straddle anymore. And uh, I'll bitch to God about that when I get up there. I don't think that's quite right. <laughs> but that is the truth. I never felt a part of till I took a drink when I was 16 years old. Then I had that experience sober, what I called middle of the road, middle of the road in sobriety, see? Trust me, ladies and gentlemen, if just going to meetings and not drinking worked for me, I'd do it. I really would. You know, I'm not going to sit here and tell you I love, you know, when I'm in Austin, Texas, Monday through Friday, between 4 and 4.15, my alarm clock goes off and my feet are on the floor. Do I like doing that? No. No. Why do I do that? I do because I like the effect produced and I want to stay in fit spiritual condition. And I don't want to ever take a drink of alcohol again. Because when I take a drink, the drink takes me and all bets are off and I lose all rights. That's why. That's why I do it. I don't do it to be a nice guy. None of that. I do it because the book says if you do this, I can promise you some great stuff. An awakened sixth sense. An awakened spirit. The ability to grow and understanding and effectiveness. You will have recovered and be given the power to help others. Amazing stuff. You'll walk hand in hand with the spirit of the universe. Wow. Cheats and chong stuff, you know. <laughs> Which, by the way, stuff we don't talk enough about in our meetings. I hope when I leave here, I'll stir up what you bring up for a topic. For example, went to a couple of meetings down here. Somebody have a topic, and I almost did this. I didn't, but... Maybe I will. Yes, I'd like you to share your experience with your new sixth sense. That's in the tenth step, by the way. Do the work in the first nine. Face and be rid of that which has you blocked from power. You get to the tenth step and eleventh step and start working those disciplines. You do have a new sixth sense. It's called your spirit, your awakened spirit. You start to go through your day and your life letting that awakened spirit guide you and move you. Fabulous stuff. What's your experience with having entered the world of the spirit? That's in the 10th step, too. That, you ever heard that as a topic? Why are we talking about this stuff? Power. This program's about power. It tells you that we agnostics. The whole purpose of this program is to enable you to develop a relationship with the power which will do for you what you cannot do for yourself. Why aren't we talking about power? Elkies love power. It is. It's a power. How about right in the middle of the fear inventory? This is another topic you'll never hear. It says, I'm going to let God demonstrate through me what God can do. Why aren't we talking about that? Why are we talking about what it's like to let God demonstrate through you what God can do? A couple of people say, well, what preparation do you do for this? And I said, nothing. Except the work in 1 through 9 of the disciplines of 10 and 11. I'm a hollow bone. I've done the work necessary to let God demonstrate through me what God can do. See, I don't have a clue what you need, but God does. So if you have any problems with anything that comes out of this mouth, it's not my fault. <laughs> but see, all this is in this book. Credible stuff. Oh, you still drink? Go to meetings. No, 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 no. No, 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 no. A life beyond your wildest dreams. Rocket scientist stuff. Great stuff. See? You wake up to all that, you take that into your life. Take that into your relationships. Take that into your careers. Take that into every area of your life. Take that kind of power. We agnostics, be an intelligent agent, spearhead of God's ever-advancing creation. What does that mean? Well, I think it means intelligent agent, spearhead of God's ever-advancing creation. See? All my troubles are my own making. Most powerful, One of the most powerful statements of hope in the big book. Why, why would I say that? Why do you think I would say that? Big Book says, all my troubles are my own making. Why is that a great thing? What if your troubles are of somebody else's making? They got to change in order for you to get well. Right? I've done a lot of work with the fourth step, fourth and fifth steps. Matter of fact, I got some inventory. I'll be reading some of it, two or three pieces.
while I'm down here. I read that to the men I work with. I'm accountable. See? If you get your sense of self outside yourself, you're in trouble. Because then something outside you has got to change, get better in order for you to be okay. It's a horrible way to live. I get my sense of self right here. You can add to me, but you can't take nothing from me. Do you hear what I just said? See, because all my troubles are my own making. Everything in my life is on loan. It's all a gift. It's on loan. Living in a world of impermanence. Don't know how long it's on loan. And if it turns to me one day and says, I'm gone, God bless you. Go in peace. Turn to the next one. What a great way to live. From that position, you can love. All my troubles are my own making. Wow. What amazing stuff. I spent years drinking because my troubles were of your making. And I'm trying to arrange my life. If Mark's arrangements would only stay put, if only people would do as Mark wished, the show would be great. Right? Listen to some gentleman read some inventory today. Probably tomorrow night. I want to spend some time talking about the fourth and fifth step. My experience over the years... And I've worked with a lot of people, a lot of varying links. Right now, I, I, uh, I'm sponsoring a woman. She's 44 years sober. Been sponsoring her for 10 years. When she came to me, she was one of the doing a lot of speaking, yada, yada, yada. Nobody would say anything to her, and she was dying of untreated alcoholism. She almost committed suicide, alone with the most sobriety. She heard a tape when I talked about almost taking myself out of here. She called me, took her through the steps, right in inventory. Tell you, doing a fifth step with somebody that long sober and I got less time was like dancing with the devil. <laughs> Unbelievable. Pulled her free of that. Pulled her free of that. Incredible. Woman's in her 80s and more vibrant and alive than anyone I know. Fabulous stuff. Doesn't matter how long you're sober, you get trapped by this stuff. See? I want to talk more about the fourth and the fifth step. What that's about. I believe in writing a lot with inventory. Why? Because my ego is as mysterious and powerful as God himself as far as I'm concerned, and I can't defeat my ego. It takes the best of us. So that's why you do fourth and fifth steps. I started to tell you my, my current... Reality, I mentioned the unmanageability. But you might consider this as an exercise. Is make a list of your own current unmanageability. The stuff that's rubbing up against you. Make a list of your current fears. I'm not talking old stuff. I'm not talking like the fear inventory itself. But all of us in this room, I would say in the last week or two, you have reoccurring fears running through your mind, don't you? That list may be six, seven, eight of them. That's what's rubbing up against you today. Then you walk into the meeting, they say, how you doing? You go, I'm just fine. <laughs> Wake up. <laughs> On the one hand, you are. On the other, you're not. Right? See, I had uh, nine fears. You know, 10.30 at night, no one's around. Finish the evening review, all hooked up. And this voice. You'll never quit smoking. You'll die a horrible death. Have a good night. <laughs> see? see? <laughs> y'all y'all know what I mean about them voices, right? You... <clears throat> we'll have a little fun. I want to introduce you to your host of characters, if I can. This morning, when y'all got up within about five or ten minutes... Imagine that you had a table. Imagine there's chairs. And you all had internal dialogue going on this morning, right? The voices? Some of you perhaps think that is a singular voice. It is not. I'll introduce you to my voices. You can identify your own. The voices are a combination 
of the different things you have going in your life that you think identify who and what you are. So, here's some of mine. We have the spiritual guy. We have Mr. AA. Those are two different guys, by the way. Mr. AA, if you don't follow the group conscious, he's going to be in your face. The spiritual guy, he's all forgiving. <laughs> different guys. We have the jock. Right? Got a jock in me. We have, uh, we have the present owner of my company. He's in there. We have the sponsor. We have the pal. We have the boyfriend. We have the author. I've always had a Rambo in me. He's in there. <laughs> and I would say for the most part, that's pretty well my host of characters. And all those are all those different identities. Well, as you well know, if you walk up to somebody and just meet somebody, what's the second or third thing out of your mouth? What do you ask them? What do you do? Like that has anything to do with anything, but we're all asleep, dreaming we're awake, so we just do that. What do you do? You know? By the way, if you want to mess with people in that area, just look at them and say, I breathe, and you? They don't know where to go with it. But here's what happened this morning. I get up. Oh, there's obviously there's a caffeine addict in there because he says, "Get the coffee going." <laughs> so I, I'm not smoking, so I didn't have to listen to Nicotine Man. Oh, I got it. I've been up against, I've been up against a new guy. I'm, I got this guy with me. He's on vacation. So the A guy says, well, you're going to give a talk tonight, so you know you got to do the disciplines, otherwise you're a goddamn liar. <laughs> so get the big book open. The guy on vacation says, no, we've got 100 pages left in that novel, damn it. We're on vacation. We want to read now. I haven't even used the bathroom. Right? Walk 10 feet. The jock. We've got to work out. We've got to work out. If we don't work out, you're going to get fat. Now I get over at the coffee pot, and I'm making the coffee, you know. Spiritual man, oh, isn't this fantastic? <laughs> Boyfriend, he had some shit to say. Just incredible. Just, uh, and those, see, I have fun with all this, but there was a time that I, at all those voices and all those identities, I really thought was me. Let me explain the problem with that. That's where all your inventory comes from. Any of those, for example, I'll give you some example. Let's say that in my, in my last inventory, I wrote on three past employees. So if you have a, a businessman and you're an owner of a company, what does he need to be to exist? He needs a company. He needs the company to be successful. So anything that happens that hurts, threatens, or interferes with that, He's fighting for his life. So he wrote inventory. I had a couple of my friends who didn't do what I wanted. So the friend wrote inventory. A couple of my sponsees didn't do what I wanted. The sponsor wrote inventory. What's the sponsor need to be to exist? Need sponsees that toe the line. Right? See, now I have a lot of fun with this, but I got to tell you, there were at, at, at one time, you know, there, there's another book said, we're the world like a loose garment. I really know what that means. I live in a world of impermanence. I'm in the world to play the role of God has signed, but I don't get attached to the role because it could end just like that. See? I've listened to some fifth steps lately. The, the one in particular is this, this relationship dynamic where a relationship ends. So imagine, you're, imagine the, the, the role that you're in is on Broadway. Show's over. Guess what we do? We go back to the theater. No one there but us. <laughs> Nobody's coming in. No other stage characters. And then we bring that into the meetings and we share with them about the old movie we used to be in. Right? <clears throat> no reality to it anymore. But we give it, except what we give it. You see what I'm saying? I do a thing I call theater of lie. I'll tell you, I'll tell you why I want to spend some time with you on this is at somewhere 
around that nine, nine and a half years, when I had gone to, to work, when I got sober, I went to work for a company working 60, 70, 80 hours a week sometimes, and that job ended a year later because most of my identity came from that job. I almost committed suicide behind that because my identity was tied into it. How many of you have had relationships end and, and had a broken heart? Well, you know why? You're getting your identity to the relationship. See, what, is a re what do you need? What, what does a boyfriend need to be to exist? Needs a girlfriend. Girlfriend says, thanks, we're done. <laughs> Peels off. She didn't just break up. She said he doesn't exist. He's fighting for his life. Big Book says, in that state, the wrongdoing of others, fancy or real, has the power to kill. This is real stuff. This is the tragedy of the ego. But I have fun with it, like Craig and I, right? You know, Craig will say, oh, I'm mad. I'll say, who's mad? Which stage character's mad? You see, you start to have fun with yourself. Quit taking yourself so seriously. See? Like Brad, he has a penchant for drama sometimes. <laughs> See? Like you guys brought that up. I said, what? He was actually late for a meeting. Can you imagine what Mr. A.A. said to him? <laughs> <laughs> Can you imagine what that voice said? <laughs> you SOB, you've been telling people for years never be late for a meeting, and now you're late. <laughs> you just gave them carte blanche to be late all the time, you idiot. <laughs> all your teachings are gone in the week of one eye. <laughs> that's after we looked at him and said, how you doing? So oh, just great, you. <laughs> <laughs> Heaven forbid a sponsee come up and said, well, I think I need to end this relationship. See, what's because what's what's the sponsor need to be to exist? Need sponsees, right? Fighting for my life. See, you can't. It's a horrible way to go through life. How are we doing on time on the uh, recording? Hello? Time? Say what? Ten minutes? 20 minutes, okay, all right. I don't want to go over, Brad said he'd shoot me if I did. <laughs> so, let's go back to this. Look at your current unmanageability. See if there's fears that you're up against. Current stuff, not old stuff, ladies and gentlemen. Current, current, right? Get current with your life. Then you get to take that into chapter two, we agnostics. Here's another little list you could make. Make a list of your current agnosticism. Some believer's sphincter muscle just went bonk, bonk. <laughs> what do you think I mean by current agnosticism? What do you think I mean by that? Any speculations? Bingo. Where God isn't. One hint would be those fears. There's no God. Current agnosticism. God and agnosticism cannot exist in the same space. By the way, don't fall for this. Some of you, I'll bet, think because you tell me you believe in God, you do. Here's the valid question. Are you living your life as though you believe in God? Hmm. See, the ego will tr the, your ego will trick you, your mind, right? I love Eckhart Tolle's definition of ego. A mind-made false sense of self. Where my mind tells me where I'm getting my sense of self from. And one of the great tricks is I tell you that I believe in God. See? We agnostics gets real clear that this is about knowing God. This is about gaining access to God. This is about an experience with God and has little or nothing to do with believing in God. What a, what a great gift we're given through this process of the steps. And it's not belief, it's knowing. It's a revolutionary spiritual experience. Make the hair in the back of your head stand up. Knowing God, big difference, huge difference. 
So when I go back through the steps again, I take a look at my current agnosticism. Because if I got some, you all got some. And I look at my fears. I look at some of that unmanageability. And I bring it into the second step again. Two parts to that second step. Am I willing to believe there's a power greater than myself that can take me past here? Here. You all understand what I mean when I say here? Everything I think I know, all my belief systems, all my experiences, is there more past here? Are there dimensions of joy, wonder, love, service, pain, that I know nothing about. Am I willing to believe that? Yes, otherwise God is finite. Yes, I'm willing to believe I can be taken past here into dimensions I know nothing about, into experiences I know nothing about. I'm willing to go for that. Yes. See? I love we agnostics. Don't try and, de don't try and define or comprehend the power. Today, I have no concept of God. I was stripped of it. It's like a wave's a part of the ocean. It has all the properties of the ocean, but it's not the ocean. That's kind of like how I feel I am with God. I have all the properties of God, but I'm not God. Yet I have all the properties. And beyond that, I don't know how to explain it. But all is well in my world, always. All is well, even if it's a mess. All is well. I distinguish between my life and my life circumstances. Stay hooked up and awake to your life. Take that into an ever-changing life circumstances, this world of impermanence, which we hate because we're fear-based. See That sense of conscious separation Chuck C. used to talk about. The more you feel separated from your true self, God and others, the more you will be afraid. That's how you'll go through life. No authenticity to that. No authenticity. Your insides and outsides do not match. Big Book talks about we present to the world our stage character. Right? Second step, another piece. Faced with a self-imposed crisis. Here's my self-imposed crisis. I'm in my 26th year. I'm up against me. That's my self-imposed crisis. I can no longer postpone or evade. I had to fearlessly face the proposition. God is everything. I'm going to place all this under God. Again, all this new stuff. What is my choice to be? And I sit with that. See, I sit with that. And then I make that choice. I'm going to do it. Now that choice for me is going to thrust me into my third step. I've been sober for a while. There's a great exercise. You get done with the ABCs and you're starting to look at your third step. There's a requirement you and I have to meet before we make our third step decision. You know what that is? Am I convinced that my life, 26 years sober, ran on my will, cannot and will not work? Stop and you sit with that. And I like to take a look at where I'm trying to run my life and my will. If any of you are struggling with that, just ask some of your friends. They'll help you. <laughs> or your significant other. Listen, honey, I'm <clears throat> 25 years sober. I just thought I'd ask you a little question. I, I'm sure you don't have much to say, but I, I'm examining whether or not I might be running any areas of my life on self-will, you know, and, if they say pull out a notebook, you know you're, you're in delusion, right? But you can sit and look at that, and you can test that. I did that. Ask a few of my employees. They said, yeah, yeah, you can be that way at times. Okay. Ask some of my pals. Yeah. Okay. Get it? And then the book spends a page and a half describing what it looks like when you and I run our life on our will. If our arrangements would only stay put, if only people would do as I wished, by the way, do as I wish also means 
how you act. See? When I listen to fifth steps or when I read inventory, visualizations work well for me. And when I'm working with this third step stuff and fourth and fifth step, I like to imagine myself in a little amphitheater like this. And it's bowl shaped. And then at the front is a stage and there's this big throne chair and my ass is parked in it. And all the people that are in my life are sitting in this amphitheater. And I can see them. And if my arrangements would only stay put, if only Craig would do as I wished and Brad would do, boom. And I have these scripts for you, the way I need you to act in order for me to be okay. Now, unfortunately, I don't give them to you. You are to read my mind. And I'm going to get my complete sense of self from scripts I've never given you. It may, it's just amazing. Now I'm going to get upset because you did not read my mind. Maybe you were a little short when, in fact, I needed all of your attention that moment to feel good about myself. You didn't give it to me. Just, you know, it's just amazing. And you sit and you look at that and you go, oh, my God, what a horrible way to live. I'm getting my entire sense of self from all these people that I have no control over. Waking up to that will get your speaker muscle moving. <laughs> Seriously. Most people, when I start working with them, have no idea they're placing their their entire life. Well, here's how it looks. It'd be like, it'd be like, uh, say, let's say that Brad was that way, right? Then if I wanted to know how Brad was feeling, I would just call all of his friends. I wouldn't even have to bother calling Brad. I just call his friends. Say, Robert, how are you doing today? I want to know how Brad's doing. Why are you calling me? Well, because if you're not doing well, Brad won't be doing well. <laughs> Don't even need to bother talking to Brad. See? We've all done that, haven't we? Right? Till I got free of this. Hell, that last marriage I was in, if you wanted to know how I was doing, all you had to do was call Carla. Say, how you doing, Carla? Not good. Thanks. I'm going to stay away from Mark. <laughs> See, I didn't set out to live that way. I didn't. I was asleep, dreaming I was awake. Had no idea that was going on. Given all my power to everything out here. Employers and her and blah, 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 blah. See, got sick behind that. A lot of suffering behind that and realized God never intended me to live that way and I was asleep to something, and what was it? And by God, I started to wake up. And I took my power back. And I did that to a lot of inventories, some outside books from spiritual teachers, like the 11 step tells us to look at. I still remember the day my entire sense of self was derived from the inside out, and I got free. That day, I could truly love you. You know why? Because you don't need to do anything for me to be just fine. And I'm just here to give, 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 and I don't need anything from you. And then the paradox of the whole thing is, when you get to that place and don't need anything, you got more coming at you and you know what to do with. But as long as I need it, I can't have it. Wow. And everything's on loan. And boy, I get that. And when you get that, you don't take anything for granted anymore. You don't take pals for granted. You don't take relationships. You don't take your hell. You don't take anything. You know, how, you know how freeing it is to, to not have to go through the day and that day being determined by someone else's behavior? Wow. What a great thing. That happens with a lot of work with the fourth and fifth step, ladies and gentlemen. But go back to your own little amphitheater. What are you trying to arrange? My arrangements would only stay put if they only do as I wished. They only elect a Democrat this time. It's just crazy stuff. They changed the immigration laws. It's just wacko stuff. If she would only behave, you know, if they'd only give me more money, if I could only sell more, yet all this is out here controlling how you're feeling, how you experience yourself. The, all I ever wanted was happiness. Well, as long as it's out there, you'll never have it. All that does is guarantee that you'll be fear-based your entire life. Right? Wow. Wow. So you start to look at what it looks like when you're living a life based on self-will. See, a life based on self-will is always externally driven. 
It's not internally driven. It's externally driven. So the extent to which something outside yourself will determine how you experience yourself is the extent to which you're living a life driven by self-will. Damn, that was good. I've never said that before. <laughs> then the book takes you over to finally describe what's wrong with us. Selfishness, self-centers is the root of my troubles. When I experience myself in that setting that I told you about, here's what happens. Where I'm getting my sense of self out here. Book says, when that goes on, I will be driven by a hundred forms of fear, self-delusion, self-seeking. I mean, I'm going to look at all you, particularly when you're not doing what I want, and I'm going to pick one of those tools, fear, self-seeking, self-delusion, self-seeking, and I'm going to use that tool to attempt to coerce you to change so I'm okay. So I go through life being driven by a hundred forms. And as a result of that, here's what I do. I step on the toes of my fellows, column one. And they retaliate, column two. And they hurt me, column three. But the book goes on to say at some point in time in the past, you know, it says invariably, which means every time, I made a decision based on me, which later placed me in a position to be hurt. I truly do create my reality. And that is a wonderful thing. And then it follows that with all my troubles are my own making. If you don't get that, you can't get free. See, I'm so glad I know that. All my troubles are my own making. Nobody else's. And then a couple of other lines, which we also don't discuss in meetings, it says... It doesn't say quit drinking at this point. You know what the book says? Matter of fact, as far as I can tell, past page 23, the book doesn't talk to you and I about drinking. The reason is simple. If I never have an obsession of the mind to convince me to take a drink, I'll never experience a phenomenon of craving. Therefore, my main problem centers in my mind. Unfortunately, I need a spiritual solution to treat the main problem centers in the mind. That's why very little of the big book is occupied with drinking because that's not the problem. Matter of fact, they tell me it's a symptom. What's the problem? I'm discussing the problem. Selfishness, self-centeredness is the root of my trouble. That's the problem. And then the book goes on to say, above everything, what does that mean? <laughs> it says, above everything, I must be rid of this selfishness or it kills me. Why don't we bring that up as a topic in meetings? I don't know what you, how you all feel, but I think the words, it kills me, are fairly significant. I think we should probably talk about that a little bit more. What is it? Selfishness. It will kill you. That's why you drink. Do you all understand the connection between your selfishness and drinking? Anybody who does it? You wouldn't answer anyhow. <laughs> Here's the connection. If I'm consumed with myself, the world's got to present itself in a certain way for me to be okay. What will happen is it won't, that won't happen that day. She won't act the way I want, the job, whatever. And then what happens is then I begin to get diseased. I begin to get resentful. And now I begin to get blocked. And if you pile a few of those up on top of me, and then you kick fear into it, and now I'm completely blocked, at some point I have a voice that would say, you know, you never have during Corona. They got a lot of that shit down here. Besides, Mark, I'm here for you, buddy. I know it's been a long time, but I'm still here. I made all this go away. And if I'm not in fit spiritual condition, I'm going to believe that, and I'm going to take a drink. And then I'm going to activate a phenomenon called craving, and once I take a drink, I don't know where it's going to take me. That's the connection between your selfishness and dying an alcoholic death. That is what we're in the rooms for, to die the death of self. By the way, another topic. Never talked about in the rooms. Fascinating topic. Right before I make my third step decision at the bottom of page 62, it says, with God's help, you and I can be entirely rid of self. Why aren't we talking about that? Do you think they meant entirely rid of self? <laughs> no, just a horseshit line just thrown in there. Yeah, they meant entirely rid of self. 
I've known some men and women sitting in their rooms who are entirely rid of self. Some of you probably know some. See? Amazing people. Entirely rid of self. All they do is love, 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 love. Don P. spoke the night before he died. Last 10, 15 years of his life. You'd look into his eyes. It's like looking into an ocean. See? He was entirely rid of self. It happens. See? Oh, just don't drink and go to meetings. No, no. Oh, my God, is there more? See? Beyond our wildest dreams. Beyond our wildest dreams. The depth and weight of what is available to us in the pages of the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous. No end to it. It went bored with AA. Really? His fa that, whenever I hear that, I think their favorite slogan must be, Meeting Makers Make It. <laughs> Let me help you with that. Meetings do not bring about a change in my interior condition. I may have a little epiphany. I will certainly feel better because I'm spending a little time with my tribe. When I walk out that door, I still got to meet myself, don't I? That's what the steps do. That's what the disciplines of 10, 11 do. They let the insides and the outsides match. Then you start taking that into the meetings, see? So, I had to have God's help. Bottom of page 62 is where you make your third step decision. It's about this relationship with this power. It's a very paradoxical thing. I'll give you another exercise. I've given you some great exercises, haven't I? Here's another one. Make a list of the areas currently in which you're playing God. Because in order to get God's help, what do we have to do? I had to quit playing God, didn't I? Everyone in here, we all got them. You got some areas, you're playing God. And the book goes on to tell me why you and I got to quit playing God. Because it, me playing God doesn't work. Because <laughs> I'm not God. And I don't know what you came down here to do or how you came down here to do it. I'm here to dance my dance, sing my song, and that's what I better get my focus on. Let you do yours. Maybe you like jazz. I happen to like rock and roll and blues. I need to stay focused on that, right? Then it talks about that relationship. God's going to be my director, and you take a dictionary and you look up those words so you're clear on them. Going to be the director, and I'm going to be the actor. Going to be the principal, and I'm going to be the agent. How come we don't talk about that? What's it like to be an agent for God? You ever look up that word? You know what that word is? And you look that word up? It means someone who has been empowered to act for someone else. Oh, heaven forbid, we don't want to act like that. There wouldn't be any humility in that. Really? Why do you think the book uses it? God is my principal. I am God's agent. What heresy he's committing. No, I'm not. More of us need to stand on that. You do this work, you're an agent of God in every area of your life. Relationships and in the meetings, how you pay tax, everything. You are an agent of God. Of and for God, that power comes through you. Stand on that. Claim that. That false humility, oh, I'll always be recovering. No, you won't. See, I'm a recovered alcoholic. Oh, no, heresy. Started on the title page. Take a Concordia. Look up. How many times the big book used the word recovery? It's only once or twice. Use the word recovered. I have recovered from a whole the state of mind and body. Now, if I lie to you, it's not because of whiskey. It's because I'm a liar. <laughs> See, by the way, I, I'm glad we're talking about this. I, I sit in meetings and everyone likes to blame alcoholism for just being an asshole. See, outside of a craving of the body, an obsession of the mind, got it. That makes me an alky. Otherwise, I'm just a human being, like all other human beings, right? If I'm a jerk, it's not because I'm an alky, because I'm a jerk. We want to contribute all, well, I, I can't have a meaningful life because I'm an alky. Read the book. What is the, that isn't what the book says. Says you're supposed to be an intelligent agent spirit of God's ever advancing creation. Right? See, all that kind of stuff. Right? 
So you get to make that decision about that relationship. And then you get those incredible third step promises. And then that leads us into saying the words. The words is not the decision. But think about these words, and then I'm going to close. God, I offer myself to thee to build with me, and you do with me as thou wilt. Relieve me the bondage of self, that I may better do thy will. Take away my difficulties, that victory over them may bear witness to those I would help, of thy power, thy love, and thy way of life. May I do thy will always. God bless you. I'll see you tomorrow night. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.